For 14 years, Francois Papadoc Duvalier rules over Haiti using violence and voodoo. I have been elected for president for life. It is the iron wheel of the Haitian people. He's a tyrant who forms his own private militia to kill some 30,000 of his people, including anyone who challenges his power. I think Duvalier was evil incarnate. If you talk to a psychologist, they would classify him as, as a psychopath. This is the story of a ruthless dictator's reign of terror over the poorest of the poor. From his manipulation of the national religion to the growth of his personality cult, Papa Doc is a name that will forever bring Haitians nightmares. April 1963. The sixth year of Haitian dictator Francois Duvalier's brutal reign is about to become the most bloody. At the presidential palace, the man they call Papa Doc gets shocking news. Someone has shot his children's bodyguard and chauffeur. It absolutely outraged Duvalier and sent him into overdrive. Blind with anger, Papa Doc summons the head of his palace guard to whom his orders are clear. Find those responsible and kill them all. The hunt starts with a man Papa Doc wrongly accuses of being behind the attack former army officer, Francois Benoit. The event started at 8 o'clock on April 26, 1963. At that time, I had already been granted political asylum at the Dominican Embassy. Though personally safe from Duvalier's goons, Benoit's family, including his father, who is a judge, his wife and infant son, remain in harm's way. Judge Benoit and his wife had just come back from church. They were at the house with the baby and with the maid and with the visitors. I saw the truck full of presidential guard run by. Everyone in the house is killed. And then set ablaze. It was a terrible day. The ashes of the Benoits was there for years and years. Over the next few hours, hundreds of people are murdered or disappear. But a horrific rumor starts to spread that a different fate awaits Benoit's infant son, who is reportedly taken to Duvalier. Duvalier is said to have closeted himself with the boy. <laughs> Nobody knows till this day what happened to Francois Benoit's little boy. Some people said he was sacrificed by Duvalier. Sheltered at the Dominican Embassy, the awful news is delivered to Benoit. 
He sacrificed not only my family, but my wife's family. Uh, anybody who was close to me, anybody who was associated with me was either arrested or killed. If you talk to a psychologist, they would classify him as, as a psychopath. Was he crazy? No, but was he evil? The answer is yes. Papa Doc, the man responsible for this atrocity, is born in 1907 in the beautiful Caribbean state of Haiti. It's a proud nation, the first slave colony to become independent. In the 18th century, it was called Saint-Domingue and belonged to the French. It was the most prosperous colony in the world at the time, uh, turning out uh, a huge number of crops which were uh, keeping the perfumed elite in Paris uh, very well fed indeed. It was estimated that one in eight people in metropolitan France owed their living directly or indirectly to the produce of Haiti, of Saint-Domingue. It was called the Pearl of the Antilles. In 1791, the slaves of Haiti rise up in revolution against the French colonial system. Under the leadership of Toussaint Louverture, and Jean-Jacques Dessalines. They fight against all the odds to liberate their country. They actually expelled the French army uh, when it was at its height. Uh, this was an absolutely incredible situation. And yet, the Haitian slaves rose up and defeated them, expelled them. The slave armies um, defeated not just the, uh, the French plantation owners, the French armies, but also the Spanish, British, the Americans, in fact, all of the superpowers of the era. In 1804, the slaves of Saint-Domingue finally win their independence, and the nation of Haiti is born. Malcolm X and Martin Luther King referred repeatedly back to the Haitian Revolution as being a kind of an ideal, and it was. It was a fantastic achievement. But when Francois Duvalier is just eight years old, Haiti loses her independence. In July 1915, with America's entrance into World War I on the horizon, the United States occupies the country. And for black Haitians like Duvalier, it's a catastrophe. The occupation was surprisingly severe, harsh, profoundly racist. For young Duvalier, the lack of respect for the Haitian people molds a hatred of the United States and all it stands for. He grew up in a, in a very cultured, articulate, black middle-class environment in poor Prince, and this is precisely the class and the group that felt most aggrieved by the American occupation. In 1934, the US military leaves Haiti, and the country becomes independent once again. It is also the year in which Duvalier completes his degree in medicine, and begins a promising career serving the people of Port-au-Prince. But his real passion, a legacy of the US occupation, is black nationalist politics. And he throws himself into a movement called Noirism. Essentially what Noirism was, was the reaffirmation with pride of, of the African roots. Following his fascination with African heritage, Duvalier starts to study Haiti's Creole religion, voodoo. Voodoo is an essentially animistic religion that um, originates in West Africa. People say that uh, Haiti is 70% Catholic, 30% Protestant, but 100% voodoo. Mm -hmm. 
Voodoo has a single creator deity, Bon Dieu. But the supreme deity does not get involved with this world. Instead, powerful demigods and spirits called Loire interact with humanity. Loire are the spirits or the gods that the Haitians pray to, just as you know, a Catholic would pray to a saint. As Duvalier studies voodoo rituals, he gains a better understanding of how the religion dominates the lives of local people. Though he is never a true believer, his fascination with the national religion will continuously grow on his rise to the pinnacle of power. There's always been an association in Haiti between voodoo and power. Most Haitians believe to this day that to have become president in the first place, you must have made some kind of pact with the devil or with the dark side of, of voodoo. Duvalier is a man full of contradictions. He is fascinated by Haitian mysticism, but he is also a modern medical man of science. In 1944, he gets a scholarship to study public health medicine at the University of Michigan. He will return as head of a program bringing modern medicine to the Haitian peasants, afflicted by a crippling skin disease called yours. Papa Doc came in and says, I'm going to change that. And using penicillin, he changed that. Duvalier becomes widely known traveling the country, bringing his penicillin cure to remote villages across Haiti. The Duvalier actually set out walking great distances on foot. He had to subject himself to hardship to actually deliver his, uh, his medical expertise to these people. He established a reputation as a, a kind man, a good man, a man who could literally come into the community and make people well. That's how he got the name Papa Doc. Because throughout the country of Haiti, Papa Doc's penicillin remedies wiped out yours. To the largely illiterate and superstitious population, Papa Doc isn't curing them with medicine alone. They think he must have mysterious voodoo abilities. People couldn't believe it was just the medicine doing it. They believed that Papa Dog had a special power in him. It's a turning point for Duvalier. He realizes that he can use his newly won reputation to gain total power. In 1946, Dr. Francois Duvalier, known affectionately as Papa Doc, begins to climb the Haitian political ladder. He becomes Minister for Health under a fellow Noirist, President Dumasé Estimé. But just four years later, the army overthrows President Estimé's regime, and Papa Doc leaves political office. Colonel Paul Magloire is installed as the new president. Duvalier goes into hiding, where he secretly begins plotting his own path to power. In a country where few are literate, he takes the opportunity to study political writings, from Marx to Machiavelli. Machiavelli told him it's better to be feared than to be loved. He learned that, and he practiced it. It's a lesson that will reshape the peasant doctor's identity, transforming him into a force of evil, primed to take power by any means necessary. In 1956, 
Francois Duvalier's nemesis, Haitian President Colonel Magloire, is himself overthrown by the army and flees the country. Under an interim government, the country trembles on the brink of civil war, while elections for president are called. Duvalier emerges from hiding and goes to the newspaper office of Bernard Diedrich. He was very quiet. He was gentle in a way. He announced that he was a candidate for the presidency. His initial objectives were entirely honorable. And he probably was an idealist, and he probably felt that he could do good things in power. Duvalier is standing as a champion of the impoverished black majority against Louis Desjoies, considered to be a representative of the country's lighter-skinned elite. He made it a fight of black versus mulatto in a country where 90% of the people are black. Papa Doc was a shoe in On September 22nd, 1957, the kindly Dr. Duvalier, who cured so many sick people, wins a landslide victory. I had no idea that there was two sides to this man. I mean, he really fooled us all. It's the beginning of decades of dictatorship for Haiti. Oh, God, we had no idea what it was going to be like. But it was murder. As he takes his seat as president of Haiti, Duvalier knows that it's not a secure position. If you look at the track record of, of presidents in Haiti, it's not very good. I mean, most of them were short term. At least two of them were actually chopped to pieces by the populace. Out of 22 heads of state between 1843 and 1915, only one completes his full term in office. Even the hero of the Haitian Revolution, General Jean-Jacques Dessalines, met a hideous fate. Dessalines himself, uh, after two or three years in power, was actually uh, dismembered in the streets of Port-au-Prince and fed to the pigs. Papa Doc is determined to be different. It was very quick, the transition from, from bumbling country doctor to ruthless dictator. Duvalier came to realize that the only way to exercise power in Haiti was to be utterly ruthless. So I think that was a kind of pragmatic decision that he reached. Duvalier quickly sets out to remove the obvious threats to his power. First up, the army. He knew that the army were the kingmakers, and he needed to make sure that the, the people in the key position in the army were his appointees. He sacks the top officers. But for now, at least, they get away with their lives. That was the start of the way that he was going to operate throughout his presidency, to, to have successive and unpredictable purges of those who thought they were secure, who thought they, they were in his favors. Just months after Papa Doc's inauguration, shots ring out near the palace. It looks like his insecurity is justified. Duvalier was under threat almost from the start. Former army officers seize the barracks next to the palace and attempt a coup. It happened early in the morning, so I went down to the palace. And there was all hell breaking loose. There was 50 caliber machine gun fire. The word spread around that there were 200 rebels. Fortunately for the Valier, most of the coup attempts, if you like, were comic opera affairs. It turns out the coup is not being launched by 200 rebels, but only eight. 
Duvalier crushes them easily. It's a pivotal moment. He decides that he just cannot trust the army and needs a new force of his own to secure his power. He felt extremely vulnerable and he felt he was in need of a Praetorian guard. Duvalier decides that he needs his own gang and that gang has to be um, meaner and bigger and tougher than the army. Papadoc orders the creation of the Volunteers for National Security. The force will become better known by the name of an ogre from Haitian folklore. The Tonton Makut. The first group of Makuts was taken out of the National Penitentiary. They were murderers, thieves, people who had, were serving time. And they were recruited from there and given weapons and a blank check to do whatever the valley asked them to do. The signature emblem of the Tonton Makut were the shades they, they always wore, uh, which gave them a particularly sinister veneer. The Tonton Makut become a key pillar of Duvalier's regime. In time, they will outnumber the regular army. But running his militia is expensive. Now Duvalier needs money, and he needs weapons. But the best source of cash is the country he hates most, America. The United States has no love for his regime. But then, Duvalier gets a lucky break. In January 1959, Fidel Castro wins his revolution. Cuba, just 50 miles across the Windward Straits from Haiti's shores, becomes communist. The rise of Castro and the Cuban Revolution was an absolute boon for Duvalier because it took the heat off him in terms of the State Department worrying about the Caribbean. Duvalier tells the Americans that he is staunchly anti-communist. But he might not always stay that way. He used it as a constant threat hanging over the Americans to say, oh, well, you know, if you don't give me another sort of $50 million in, in aid, I might just have to look elsewhere, maybe east, you know, or maybe to our friends over the Windward Straits. Papadoc's blackmail works. The United States sends millions in financial aid and a detachment of Marines to train his forces. With the country he hates now bolstering his regime, it seems that Duvalier is secure. But he has an Achilles heel. Papadoc is a diabetic. On May 24, 1959, he collapses and falls into a coma. It lasts for some nine hours. Eventually, Duvalier's right-hand man, Clement Barbeau, administers a glucose injection. Papadoc regains consciousness. His life was saved in terms of the initial first aid by Clément Barbeau and then by um, the Americans who treated him, I believe, at Guantanamo. But the president wakes up a changed man. He was in a coma for quite a long period, and there is some evidence that this may have created some brain damage or some long-lasting change in, in his behavior. Papadoc is about to go from ruthless to madly evil. After that illness, he became a different person. Papadoc begins to behave as a powerful voodoo demigod, or Loire, Baron Samedi. Baron Samedi is the head of the cemetery. He's one of the most powerful voodoo gods. Baron Samadhi in Haitian folklore is the ultimate 
terrifying figure. He, he is the person who stalks the graveyard at night. He's the Haitian Grim Reaper. Papa Dog used to dress himself in black all the time, officially, and with a big humbug hat in his head, just like Baron Samedi is portrayed. Baron Samedi himself was meant to speak in a particular way. It was a particular sort of low-pitched, lisping sort of voice. Duvalier himself started to affect precisely that voice. Qu'il flotte désormais dans l'azur pour rappeler à tous les Haïtiens. It becomes clear to some near him that Duvalier has gone mad. He was clearly unbalanced. I think he becomes paranoid about everything and everyone. The first sign of his change comes when Duvalier decides to overturn the Constitution, which allows him only one term in office. He calls elections in 1961, and there is only one name on the ballot for president. Francois Duvalier. Well, elections, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a farce. It was a ritual uh, to celebrate Francois Duvalier's uh, regime. Papadoc wins the election by an incredible 1.3 million votes to zero. The New York Times reports that Latin America has witnessed many fraudulent elections throughout its history, but none more outrageous than the one which has just taken place in Haiti. It's a victory that sets up his second term to be far more evil than the first. That's when the regime becomes totally brutal, absolutely paranoid. That is the beginning of uh, utter violence. Using the army and his private militia, the Tonton Makut, Papadoc establishes a reign of terror. Brutality became institutionalized and pervasive throughout uh, the island. Duvalier's Tonton Makut infiltrate every stratum of Haitian society. It was a system that probably similar in terms of silencing the population as the Stasi in East Germany. The main purpose of this terror is simple greed. Even though Haiti is desperately poor, Papa Doc and his cronies set about milking it dry. Millions of dollars in taxes and aid vanish into the pockets of his regime. It was all about money. I think it would be wrong to dignify Duvalierism with the name of an ideology. It wasn't really an ideology. It was generalized kleptocracy. It was the mob running a country. The people who suffer, suffered most were really the poorest Haitians. There were thousands of anonymous victims of Duvalier people being tortured to death and shot and murdered because they wouldn't give their daughter to the local Makuts or because they wouldn't give their business to the local Makuts. Nobody knows how many people that the, the Makuts killed. The dictator is now increasingly paranoid, lurking most of the time in his heavily fortified palace. When he does venture out, it is under heavy guard. To show that he cares for his people, he hands out petty cash. It's his way of proving to himself how much his people love him. I mean, I remember Duvalier in his car throwing money at people and people uh, running to get, you know, a dollar or something like that. So to me, that was utter indignity. <laughs> Washington has been providing millions of dollars a year in aid to Haiti. 
but it's clear that the money is being siphoned off. President Kennedy decides he has had enough of the mad dictator, Papa Doc. Kennedy was really anti Duvalier and was doing everything possible to get rid of him. Kennedy cuts financial aid and looks for ways to reintroduce democracy. It seems that Papa Doc's time in office may be running out. But then, the unthinkable happens. When Kennedy was assassinated on the 22nd of November, Papa Doc Duvalier had champagne at his palace with his psychophants. Incredibly, Papa Doc claims the assassination is all down to him. He explains that he put a voodoo curse on Kennedy and that it's no coincidence the president was killed on November the 22nd. He did everything on the 22nd. The 22nd was his lucky day. He got elected on September 22nd. He was inaugurated October 22nd, and he purported to have killed Kennedy on November 22nd, 1963. His boasting is designed to reinforce the idea that no matter how powerful they may be, the fate of anyone who opposes Papa Doc is death. If your president is in some sense synonymous with this supernatural taker of lives, then he is not to be messed with. With Kennedy gone, the pressure from the United States is off Papa Doc. But Duvalier soon realizes he has other problems. 13 young Haitians based in New York decide that now they have to take matters into their own hands. Calling themselves the Jeune Haiti, or Young Haiti, they set sail for their homeland in summer 1964. When Kennedy was assassinated, Jeune Haiti movement felt that they had lost a great supporter. And they didn't feel that the Johnson administration would push through with program that Kennedy had for Haiti. Most of the Jeune Haiti have lost family to Papa Doc's brutal regime. Inspired by Castro's success in Cuba, they land in Haiti and attempt to start a revolution. 13 of them left New York uh, and went to Haiti to carry out guerrilla movement, just like Castro did in the Sierra Maestra. They were going to do that in the mountains of Haiti. But the rebels quickly discover that the geography of Haiti is not well suited to guerrilla warfare. But the mountains of Haiti be, were not as uh, wooded as uh, Sierra Maestra. And Papa Doc, who had his uh, goons throughout Haiti, tracked them down. One by one, the members of the Jeune Haiti are killed. The first to die is Ivan Larac. His body is returned to Papa Doc. He actually left the stinking body in an armchair outside the arrivals hall of Port-au-Prince uh, International Airport, so that the few tourists that Haiti got at the time went through passport control, went out to get their taxi, only to be confronted by this uh, decaying, rotting body. For months, the Jeune Haiti struggle on in the mountains. Eventually, 11 of the group are killed and the remaining two captured. They are returned to Port-au-Prince, where the execution is set for November 12th, 1964.
Diwali declared a public holiday, um, told school children, school teachers, that they had to bring their school children to watch the executions. This is how we deal with the enemies of uh, Haiti. The um, executions were filmed and were played on television for weeks afterwards. Marcel Numa, a graduate of the Bronx Merchant Marine Academy, and Louis Drouin, a finance graduate and bank worker in New York, are defiant to the bitter end. The execution was, was typical of Duvalier's sense, rather macabre sense of theatre, that if you, could, if you could stage an execution, then televise it, and to make it even more grotesque, bring in a group of school children to witness it, because then the impact throughout Haiti would have been immense. I remember watching on TV the live execution of uh, Marcel Numa and Gusle Lidouin. I mean, here you have two guys who are standing, you know, with their hands in their back, and then all of a sudden they, they shoot at them and then they fall. That, that, that has never been able to be erased from my mind. It's like yesterday I was seeing it. The tyrant discovers that most of the revolutionaries come from the town of Jeremy, a stronghold of opposition. Papadoc unleashes his horrific vengeance on the town. Duvalier was someone who relished revenge. He wasn't one to enjoy it cold. I mean, he preferred it hot. Families were taken, children and wives killed first, with their husbands watching and then the husband's killed. Uh, it's not clear how many people died, uh, but uh, it's probably in the thousands. It tells you something about Duvalier, and that is that he wanted punishment to be exemplary, and therefore the more blood-curdling, the more violent, the more indiscriminate, the more effective it was. By the end of 1964, Duvalier has killed thousands of people and has got what he always wanted, total power. Inside Haiti, there is simply no opposition left. There is nothing that can stop his evil regime. I think, I think by this period, Duvalier could be defined as a megalomaniac. Power is, is everything, there is no alternative. He can't leave, he can't retire, he's got to stay there. So whatever it takes, he will do. Yet total power is not enough for Papa Doc. He wants to be more than a president. He wants to become a god. In June 1964, the tyrannical president Francois Papadoc Duvalier moves to take total and perpetual control of the country. He's used brutal violence to hold on to power for almost seven years already, even overturning the constitution to allow himself a second term in office. Now he goes further, holding a constitutional referendum to make himself president for life. Unsurprisingly, he wins with 99.9% .9 of the vote. I have been elected for president for life. It is not a, my desire, but it is the iron will of the Haitian people. Papadoc's madness now goes to new and truly extreme levels. Addressing the nation, he delivers a bombshell. He declares that he is more than human. He is an immaterial being. Bullets cannot hurt him. He was essentially saying that he was eternal. He was some sort of, uh, of spirit hovering over Haiti. Papadoc is now stating openly what many Haitians already believe, that he is an incarnation of the dreaded voodoo loire, Baron Samadhi, guardian of the graveyard. Violence may have won him his position as president for life, 
But what will keep him there is voodoo. Duvalier had more power in Haiti than the arms, the weapons, the men he had around. Papa Doc used voodoo to control the nation. Ever since the Yours campaign and dressing up as Baron Samedi, Papa Doc has played on the perception that he has supernatural powers. The vision he had for himself was full control of the society through mystical power. Papa Doc starts creating myths about himself. Rumors circulate that Duvalier makes a journey into the hills. He goes to a cave known as the True Foubon. It's a sacred voodoo site where he is believed to have found something terrifyingly useful. He brought back from Truffaubon a bunch of demons called Baka. And he had them installed. They lived, I don't know what they did there, but they lived in the, in the cellars of the National Palace. The idea that he's got these demons ready to unleash um, is quite a disincentive uh, to revolt or rebellion. Papadoc needs to demonstrate to his people that he really does have voodoo powers. So he orders his men to hijack a funeral and steals the casket of his former friend and sometime political rival, Clément Jumel. Soon a story starts circulating about how he closets himself in a room with Jumel's corpse and appears to communicate with it. Papa Doc is letting people think he has power to even talk to the dead. Death in Haiti for many people is not natural. So people think that Duvalier had made a zombie out of Jumel. For his voodoo rituals, Papa Doc often does not need the whole body. Sometimes he demands that the decapitated heads of his enemies are brought to him. Again, bizarre rumors circulate about what he does with them. De Valle became convinced that he could actually extract intelligence from the heads of political enemies. He would actually sit in the bath, sometimes complete with top hat, and consult the head of uh, this uh, opponent. The purpose of these rituals is to scare his uneducated and superstitious nation. Is Duvalier so mad that he actually believes in them too? Some who knew him say he does not, but what is beyond doubt is that he knows how to use voodoo. Duvalier used to smile because he was an atheist. He didn't believe in voodoo. He didn't believe in anything, just power. To have peace and stability, you, you, you should have a strong man in every country. By the end of the 1960s, Papadoc is more than president for life. He has his people thinking he is almost a god. But there is one force he cannot evade, his own mortality. He has so terrified, murdered, um, cowed the opposition that the only enemy really left is, is the Grim Reaper and his, his own failing health. Unlike most dictators, Duvalier may get to rule until the end of his natural life. The trouble is, he's now in his early 60s, riven with diabetes, congestive heart failure, and brain damage from his coma in 1959. So now he sets about securing a legacy for himself and his brutally corrupt regime. By the beginning of the 1970s, Papa Doc's voodoo persona dominates Haiti. People believe that he really is Baron Samadhi. The whole of Duvalierism was about the establishment of terror. And it was a terror that was inside people's heads. People were even afraid to think bad thoughts about Duvalier.
Papadoc's brutal regime may have killed 30,000 Haitians, but the official line is that Duvalier is a living god. Across Haiti are monuments to the ego of the tyrant. His name is spelled out in lights at the National Palace. After the President for Life uh, move comes the cult of personality, where Duvalier wants to project himself as almost synonymous with the country. No praise is too great for the supreme Papa Doc. They fell over each other to, to invent new superlatives to describe him. Master of the crossroads, the Haitian flag floating, and the man who sees forever. <laughs> the Lord's Prayer is rewritten as a prayer to Papa Doc, so our Doc who art in the National Palace. All the while, the people are being made to worship him. The tyrant is sucking the nation dry stealing millions of dollars a year from the Haitian people. This basically took the form of extortion of taxes on everybody, uh, on businessmen, on peanut vendors, anybody who get money, even you know, a few cents, it all mounted up. One of the most grandiose excuses for extra taxation is a whole new town, Duvalierville. It's intended to be a show of modernity and hope for Haiti but never gets finished. This money went pretty much directly into the pockets of Duvalier and his family and his, and his cronies. But Duvalier is still a trained doctor. He knows that his own death is around the corner. So he sets about securing his legacy. It was something that happened fairly quickly, but systematically. Papa Doc's eldest son, Jean-Claude, is still a teenager, brought up in the palace living a life of luxury and cut off from the concerns of normal Haitians. Nevertheless, his father decides that he will inherit the presidency. Prior to that, Jean-Claude was known simply as a kind of a fat playboy. He appears in public with his son and anoints him officially as the next president for life. On April 21st, 1971, the tyrant, Papadoc, dies peacefully in his bed. His son, Jean-Claude, becomes Baby Doc and will continue the corrupt Duvalier regime for another 15 years. Ultimately, he is overthrown and dies of a heart attack, aged 63, while awaiting trial for his crimes. Papadoc's true legacy is that he destroyed a dream and unleashed a nightmare. His crimes haunt Haiti to this day. I think Haiti was, was permanently scarred and disfigured by Duvalier. Haiti is now the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, crippled by a lack of education and racked by political chaos. The institutions were destroyed, the families were destroyed, uh, the country in a whole was destroyed. The only one for to benefit from those atrocities was himself. How evil was Papa Doc? I think Duvalier was evil incarnate. 